Well, good morning, everyone. Yeah, it's a beautiful sunny day, and we are going to have a hybrid service. So we'll do our, our worship time and communion time inside here. And then we'll head out. You might have seen as you come in the biblical garden. We've got chairs set up, and we'll have our uh, Thanksgiving time and sermon time out there. But we do have the AC inside here, so make sure to sort of soak it up. Cool the inside so that you can go out and stay cool a little longer. Ah, it's another wonderful opportunity to praise the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. I invite you to stand. I'll give us an opening word of prayer, and we'll get into a time of worship this morning. Dear Lord, holy is your name, O oh God. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for creating us and loving us. God, we see just as children, as, as humans in general, that you've gifted us with the ability to create things, whether it's Lego sets or technology and things. And then we see how we treat those things. And quite often, we, we, don't, we might say we love some of those things, and we do treasure some of them, but we don't, we don't necessarily love all the things that we created the way that you love us. God. And Lord, your love surpasses that, surpasses the love that we can have by ourselves. God, thank you for loving us enough, for creating us, and then loving us enough to decide that it was worthwhile to suffer and die for us. God, thank you for taking the punishment and scorn of the cross so that we did not have to. And thank you, Lord, for conquering death and giving us hope of eternity with you through your resurrection. Lord, this morning I ask that you would just help focus our minds and hearts on you, push aside the stuff of the week, and help us to unite in you for your glory. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Over all the earth. Over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my one request, Lord, my only aim. You reign in me again, Lord, reign in me, reign in your power over all my dreams. In my darkest hour, you are the Lord of all I am. So won't you reign in me again?
be seated. Now I'll have uh, Mike Langham come forward and give us our communion devotion for this morning. I'm going to read from uh, uh, Galatians, end of verse 1, where it talks about uh, Galatians verse 1, just starting with verse 18. It says, then after three years, I, Paul, went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report, the man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praise God because of me. Can you imagine what, imagine what God can do? You know, and Paul, of course, called himself the chief of sinners, but, you know, I think for the most part, we're all the chief of sinners. Um, but, Paul, but, but Christ... And see, and Paul had a choice, right? Like we all, we all, we all have a choice. Paul had a choice to say, no, no, I'm going to follow the law. But Paul didn't. He followed Christ. He followed grace and mercy. Paul preached. Paul preached Christ, but he preached a lot of grace. You know, I mean, you know in Romans, he says, shall we continue in grace? So I can continue in sin, so grace may abound. By no means. So Paul wasn't saying grace is a license to sin. Far from it. Because the law showed us right our sin. But grace showed us a different thing than sin. Grace showed us Christ. And without grace, there's no hope for any of us without grace. Um, so we praise God for Paul. Um, you know, and I, I guess it's, just imagine... One of the things uh, the late Brandon Manning said, one of his famous quotes was, I think uh, God loves us as we are, not as we should be. Amen? Amen? Father, I thank you, Lord, for, I thank you, God, that you did give us, you gave us Paul, the Apostle Paul, to preach to most of us in this congregation who are Gentiles. God, Jewish man that, that preached to the Gentiles. Thank you for that, God. We thank you for just everything that you've done, everything that you're going to do, all the forgiveness of all of our sins, past, present, and future, Lord. Um, thank you for your grace and mercy. God, help us to bestow a lot of that grace on your people. Lord, help us to bring others to you, God, because it's about grace, and people don't want to see grace for some reason. They want to live by the law. They want to live by what they can do. But, Lord, that's never good enough. Lord, it's about your son, Jesus. God, it's a simple thing. But so many people don't. Don't believe that. So many people say it's got to be be more difficult than than just to believe in, in Jesus, to just to trust in him for salvation. God, but it's not. Lord, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning, Trinity Christian Fellowship. I love you. Hey, school has started locally. Kids are starting to learn something. Does that mean we have to learn something too? Yes, it does. All the time if you're a believer in Jesus and we got the best book to learn it in. But right now, let's pause and go to the Lord in prayer. Great God in heaven, we're talking right now. Open our hearts and our ears, especially to hear what you are saying through your word to us today. Lord, we're grateful for the scriptures. We're grateful for the power that they have. Lord, we're grateful for the way in which they expose the things in our own lives that uh, we didn't know were there. Lord, help us to hear your Holy Spirit, not the devil's voice. And I pray, Father, you would guide us through each thing that is to be formative and instructive in our lives, Lord. Thank you for the hope that we have, the encouragement that is in the scriptures, Lord. And Lord, always help us to remain faithful in prayer, praying as Jesus taught us how to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Turning your Bibles to the book of Hebrews chapter 4. We will be there in just a moment. We are in our series on theological topics, and we've just concluded the Trinity, as well as looking at specifically at the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now we're turning to that topic, which tells us how we've learned that there is a Trinity and a Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that is the Bible. Hey, you know, we uh, need to really hold on to that which is written. You know, if you don't write it down, it's going to get distorted. I find that more and more in my own life, for sure. And it was valuable to Jesus, a concept of written scriptures that were going to come after he had finished his life here and went back up into heaven. In scriptures, it talks about this phrase, according to the scriptures, quite a few times in the New Testament. In the, the, the phrase that is written, uh, uh, the phrase, it is written, was used 63 times in the New Testament, most of those times by Jesus. And it's showing Jesus' direction to us to keep focus on that which is written down. If it isn't written down, it's going to get distorted. That's one of the great things about libraries. It's written down. It's going to read the same whenever you're reading it. Okay, maybe interpretations will vary over time, but um, no, the original is pretty clear. And that's the, one of the powers of it being written written down. Now, there's different groups, uh, for instance, in the Jewish religion and the Roman Catholic religion. In the, in the Jewish religion, they talk about an oral Torah, which they say when Moses received the law on Mount uh, Sinai, that God told him a bunch of things, a bunch of interpretations that Moses never wrote down. It was just for him to tell to the next generation, who told it to the next generation, and ultimately to the rabbis. And so there's this whole oral interpretation that is not written down along with the Word of God. So there's two, the uh, written and the unwritten. A similar type of thing has to do with oral, um, um, the uh, oral traditions in the Roman Catholic Church, in which they say the same thing happened with the disciples, that they had many things that were told by Jesus that were not written down, and so those were passed along and so forth. Um, for those who, there's a lot of people who are kind of skeptic of that which is not written down, uh, because a lot of us have played that old uh, game uh, uh, gossip, <laughs> in which it shows how quickly things get uh, distorted if it's just left verbally. Even our own brains can play tricks on us if it isn't isn't written down, and uh, so we understand that yeah, things could get distorted if you're just going off of verbal. But another thing. Jesus many times was confronted with the oral Torah, the tradition of the elders. It's called a bunch of things. But basically, it is this, this behind-the-scenes interpretation that was not in Scripture. And Jesus never 
bought into it. Jesus never dignified it or had anything to do with it. His thrust has always been what has been written down. And so that is our thrust as well here. So what we're looking at right now is we're going to look at my three favorite verses on the Bible, the written down. And one of the neat things about this is I had in my head how all this sermon is going to go, and then I did my study, and I was confronted that I need to make some changes. And so this sermon is in my mea culpa of changing gears, a different call that's from the scriptures is plainly there. And that's what I'd like to share with you today in those three favorite verses. My first one, in one word, is the word penetrates. And that is in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And it says this, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So many times I have done research in the scriptures, Bible college, seminary, every sermon Bible study since for all these zillions of years that I've been pastoring. And so many times I thought, okay, it's me opening the word of God, getting a verse, slicing it, dicing it, cutting it down to its little pieces, trying to check everything that's in there. According to this verse, the Word of God is the sword. It's not the thing that gets sliced and diced. It's the thing that does the slicing and dicing. And the one that's supposed to get sliced and diced, the reader. Me, you, anytime we pick it up. That's what's getting looked at. We think we're trying to examine God or the things pertaining to God's history here on this planet. When we open scripture, and what we don't realize, we open scripture, and it's almost like there's a malware virus in it in some respect, that it gets out of the scripture, it's alive and active, it gets into our eyes, and then it starts scanning us, our identity, and who we are down to, the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. That goes deep. Oh, wow. Examining God? You're the one getting examined. In John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, right near the end of that Gospel of John, it says why his book is written, maybe all of Scripture. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God and that by believing, you may have life in his name. The reason it was all written down, so I can believe in Jesus. I can have life in his name. Not that I can get all my questions answered, which is nice. Scripture can do that. That's not the point. Not that I can learn some neat, Bible trivia so I can get a few questions out of the Jeopardy game, right? No, that's not the point either. There is trivia there, though. Not that I can get every doctrine lined on up and win the doctrine lottery that I got guessed all correct numbers and the doctrines of God. Not the point either, that I can know Jesus. That is the point. The second verse that I like, and summarizing the two words, God breathed, is in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It says, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching and rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now in this, it says that there is, um, the word of God is, useful. God breathed and is useful. You'd expect that word to be other than useful. The word of God, you know, the uh, all scripture is God breathed and is dynamic, is omnipotent, is powerful, is amazing, is authoritative. But that's not what it says here. 
coming from Paul that says all scripture is God breathed and is useful. A little bit anticlimactic, but very practical. And it says in this, it dials down our shock and awe words to something more pragmatic. And it says it can do th four things for us. Number one, it's teaching. And let's just categorize that entirely as doctrinal. Knowing more about God and all theological concepts off of that. Hallelujah. But then it goes into a couple other words. It says also that it is um, profitable for rebuking. Okay, they're not rebuking God. So who are they rebuking? The reader, me, you. The next word, correcting. Okay, who are they correcting? Are they correcting God? No. The reader, you, me. And lastly, it says for training in righteousness. And the word for training there is a word for little kids learning. Potty training level. Learning to do your chores, to make your bed, to uh, do what you're told to do to mind mama and papa and so on. That level of training. The Word of God is useful for doing those things. The first one was theological, yeah. The next three, uh, uh, totally behavioral. How we are supposed to live our life. In uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, it tells us a little bit more about the dynamic going back to the concept of Scripture being God-breathed. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, it says this, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by a prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is saying that this God breathed, and, and the name Holy Spirit, the word spirit means breathed, <coughs> pardon the cough, that um, the Holy Spirit being the breath of God, God is authoritative. God wrote this. Yeah, it used human authors, but they weren't just putting their pet peeves down and calling it scripture, trying to win the argument, trying to show the world or make a big splash or whatever. No, this is God's stuff. He put this together and put it out for us to read. And so when we come to this precious word, we come to this with submission. Submission to the power of God, to the authority of God. Not whether it's not mine, whether I agree with the position or not. I hold on to it. You know, I look at a lot of things. Ten Commandments, one of them, coveting. I could honestly say, if it were left to me, there's other things I would have put in the top ten besides coveting. But who cares what I say? It's God's book. And I submit to it. Whether I get it all or not, there's a lot of things that are in modern society or society a couple hundred years ago or society a couple year, hundred years from now that, you know, I would say there might be some social controversies, but I don't really care one way or another. But maybe God's word does. And it's his word that counts. I am a nothing and you are a nothing too. We cannot presume that we in all of our enlightenment, enlightenment know better than the word of God. We do not. Anybody who has a difference with the word of God, uh, write your own book, get your own billion people, and do your own religion. But the word of God it's his, not yours for approval. Ours to submit to. But the last uh, verse that I come across, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 14 through 16, and I call this one, Handle with Care. <laughs> Word of God is powerful. Listen to this. Uh, the Verse 15, which is the middle verse out of the ones I'm looking at, 
is one that I remember as a little kid learning, memorizing as a, as a little kid in Sunday school or vacation Bible school or whatever, and they have little songs made out of this verse and so forth. And I remember it from the King James Version, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman who needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And I love that verse because it talks about studying the word of God. Hallelujah. Unfortunately, that's word study in the original Greek is not there. It's in the King James and some few other translations, but that's not the word at all, not even close to the right word. The word there just means being diligent. Be careful to do your best. That's what it means. The idea of study has to do with maybe either reading a book and cramming for an exam or watching something else and just studying the whole scenario really attentively. That's what study normally means to us. It's not a book pursuit that is calling us here. It's saying make the best effort you can. And in regard to that, it talks about Handling things the right way has to do with how you deal with the people around you. The verse before that, in verse 14, says this, Keep reminding God's people of these things. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is of no value, only ruins those who listen. Do you like to argue scripture? Shame on you, because it says quarreling is wrong. It's a sin. Don't. It's a misuse of the Word of God. People are not going to be cozying up to the Word of God if it's used as a weapon against them. God can use it maybe as a sword against me, but that's His thing. It's not mine. In the verses after the one that I just talked about, it says, avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. What is the godless chatter? The verses right afterwards underscore. There were local guys barking about theology, arguing with whoever they could get to argue with them. Uh, no. <laughs> you know, there's other verses talking about making all your words sweet and so on. But the thing is, is that we've got to make the Word of God a wonderful thing to connect with. There's a good way, a right way, and a wrong way to handle the Word of God. And in this one verse that we looked at in the middle, of that verse 15 in there, where it says, do your best to be a workman, a proved workman, who does not need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. The words in there are pretty important, because the word that is just translated in my translation, rightly handling, actually means straight cutting, or correctly cutting the word of truth. And so if you look at the very beginning, throughout that verse, it says, you know, study to show thyself approved, or however you want to translate it. A workman who does not need to be ashamed. A workman. The word there for workman is a guy who works with his hands, works in the factory, works in the shop. Manual laborer. Not the teacher, not the theologian, not the philosopher. Mm -mm. None of these brainiac people who are reading and researching in the scribes. Mm -mm 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 -mm. No. A workman who does not need to be ashamed, straight cutting, correctly cutting the word of truth. The idea, hey, if you needed to get a board that was 72 and a half inches long and you cut it 72 and a quarter inch long, you screwed up. And you have to go back to your, the lumber yard, Home Depot, wherever, and do the walk of shame of the do-it-yourselfer that you screwed up and you need to get another board. We're told here there's a right way and a wrong way. If you cut correctly, you know the old phrase, measure twice, cut once. Measure once, cut twice, you made a mistake. There's a right way and a wrong way to, for these people to chisel the block that's going to be used in the big fancy column building that they're making in town at that time. If you're a person who's cutting tiles for a mosaic in the somebody's floor, you got to make sure that it's just the right size. If you're making a dress, if you're making leather goods, whatever it happens to be, you make the wrong cut, you screwed up the material. The Word of God is that material. And is telling to the people who are not the theologians or the big teachers or whatever, 
there's a right way and a wrong way to go about handling that word of God. Don't screw up. Don't mess up. You're a craftsman. Make the word of God something that is healing, that is wonderful, that is correct, that is true, that is inviting and welcoming for the people to learn the word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to apply to our lives the things like back then the people learned on the job if they wanted to keep their job to do it the right way. Lord, help us to handle your word in the correct manner never having to do the walk of shame because we blew it. But Lord, by your Spirit, teach us your ways. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Now let's say our benediction together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. God bless.